What is going on? Welcome back to another episode of It's a Blast Podcast. My name is Mike, also known as the EOD Happy Captain on X. Today, I'm sitting down with Eric and Nick, two Special Forces Lieutenant Colonels who recently wrote an article for the Harding Project titled Think, Drink, Link, talking about online mentorship. If you like the content that I'm producing, please like, subscribe, and leave a review. Let's get started. Welcome to the It's a Blast podcast. My name is Mike. Here, I talk to members of the veteran and military community about their leadership style and how the military has affected their lives. Let's get started. What is going on? I am sitting down with Eric and Nick, two Special Forces Lieutenant Colonels who recently wrote an article titled Drink, Think, Link, Guiding Online Mentorship. We are here today to talk to them about that article and their business in the Harding Project. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Uh, just greetings to everybody from lovely Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where I'm here for the pre-command course. And Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing, doing great. I'm here at uh, Fort Liberty, uh, enjoying a sunny day. Thanks for, thanks for having us on the show today. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk to you today about this article that you wrote. Um, and first, kind of want to talk about the Harding Project. Uh, what is the Harding Project? So the Harding Project is this real attempt to try and reinvigorate writing in the Army. It's actually been something that's waned and waxed throughout uh, the last couple hundred years and really trying to push it again. Uh, so Chief Staff of the Army, a bunch of the leaders are actually really pushing to do this. A friend of ours, uh, Zach Griffiths, reached out to me and been bugging me to write forever, surreptitiously asked me, hey, you've been doing this NSTR thing for a long time. You mind writing up your thoughts on, on how to run an online mentor thing? So I asked no problem. I'll, I'll knock up some notes. Knocked him over, sent him to Zach, and he's like, this would be a really good like article you could put on. So we wrote it to go right on the Harding Substack, and then when we get the article done, Nick and I finished it up and ended up getting published in, uh, in Military Review as well. So it's a great effort to try and get service members to sit down, think about what they're doing, capture those thoughts, and then pass them on and share them around. Yeah, and you had spoken uh, NSTR. Nick, what is that? Yeah, NSTR, I'll, I'll give you the, the quick pitch. So like many people, we have text chains where we share links and articles with each other. Uh, and we realized about five years ago that it started growing uh, to the point where a text chain wasn't good. So we, we moved to Facebook Messenger. We quickly outstripped that, it didn't work. And then we jumped to a couple of other online sites. Currently it sits on a, a Discord. And all it is is just a, a coalition of the willing of people that are like-minded trying to engage in uh, professional conversations. Started off with very military heavy, and now it's uh, kind of a, an eclectic mix of people uh, that are sharing thoughts and having conversations online. Yeah, so I actually jumped on that Discord uh, server last week to kind of prep for this interview and kind of see what's going on there. It is it is active. It is incredibly <laughs> active. I mean, it's active to the point where I had to mute it, right? Because it was going off at all hours of the day and night. And my wife is like, why is your phone just blowing up right now? So it's obviously a, a very active online mentorship tool, which is what we're going to talk about today, right? This article, Drink, Think, Link, Guiding Online Mentorship. Um, and so can you give me a brief synopsis, Eric, of, of what that article is about and what we're talking about there? Well, one, I commiserate our spouses both also, like have, we all have that on, on mute now after all the chirps, but some of it is exactly that we're all in the military. We all move every three years at best. Uh, some of us more often than that, and we are all over the globe. And so part of the reason you're getting chirps all throughout the day is because people are jumping onto the site when it's convenient for them, when they're, when it's daylight in their world. Um, and so it's this great opportunity for everybody to kind of be able to share those those things. So that's the big part of it. Yes, the name of the article was Drink, Think, Light. And uh, Drink, Think, Link. And a lot of people, I think, took that to be bring back the O Club. And it's like, no, no, like mentorship needs to evolve beyond the O Club. It needs to evolve to digital platforms because that's where everybody is these days. And it's got to involve that asynchronous. You're not going to have your mentor be the person that you can go down the hallway and talk to all the time. A lot of time your mentor is going to be somebody that's on the other side of the globe uh, that's helping you work through a problem. Yeah, Nick. And so, you know, there's some great tidbits in this article. So at one point you guys write in 20 years of service, the army never, never gave either of us a class on how to write an officer evaluation report. And I think, you know, I've been in for 16 years now, done both the NCO and the officer side. And, and I think that's true across the board, right? I cannot think of really outside of some basic professional military education, which was a check the block type of training when it came to writing evaluations, I've never gotten that. And so, you know, it was mentors along the way who taught us, mentors who spent hours late night in Iraq and Afghanistan typing on the Merc chat, help us navigate these trying times. 
However, not everyone is so lucky. So what do we do, you know, as members of the military, because we have people that are listening to this or watching this who are from all branches. Uh, when we talk about mentorship, how do we find a mentor? Can I just go to somebody and say, you know, will you be my mentor? How does that work? Yeah, I, I, let me jump on that one first. And I'll pass it over to Eric. So uh, I don't know if we got into it. Uh, I know we've recorded this a couple of times, but uh, we're both special forces officers. And, and Eric was one of my first special forces company commanders when I showed up as a young detachment commander to first special forces group as well. And I would offer that he's, he's provided quite a bit of mentorship to me uh, over the years, but I would push back on maybe the notion that uh, mentor protege or mentor mentee is like going steady. It's not like you go and provide a shiny pebble to somebody and say, will you be my mentor? And that formalizes a relationship. In reality, it's finding uh, an organic relationship where people can provide uh, feedback to you uh, whether it's personal or professional, uh, to help you understand where you sit and, and help you understand where you want to go as well. And one of the things we, I think we were talking about before the recording started was uh, instead of saying, hey, I need one mentor, uh, a lot of people will have a board of advisors. They'll find people in different walks of life uh, that they can draw upon their experience and their wisdom uh, to help them navigate certain aspects as well. And it's super smart. And if you don't have a board of advisors and it doesn't have to be something formal, uh, I recommend you start thinking about what are your what are the holes in your swing and, and find those people. So, Eric, I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, I just did the second note. It's definitely not going steady. It's a lot of late night, like picking up the phone and going, hey, you up? Uh, I need some assistance. Um, it's not plagiarism in the Army is one of the great things. So, like, every good thing that ever came out of me in command was a stolen line from somebody else. And those lines you steal from, those are your mentors. Those are the people you reach back to. I got really lucky. I, I will candidly admit I got more great mentors and great leaders than the average person should have gotten. Um, but it goes back. We'll go back to that first OER class. My infantry company commander, first OER. <clears throat> hey, come over here, sign this. Signed it. And I go back. I was actually task organized to a tank company in Iraq. And so tank company commander sees me walking back and he's like, you signed your OER? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, what did it say? And I'm like, oh, seem complimentary. And he goes, no, what did it say? And I'm like, no. Mm. So go print it out, come back. He sits me down. First person and he goes, no, this is what it says. And I was like, it was first OER. It was fine. But like, that was the first time somebody right. did it. And it wasn't even my branch. It wasn't even actually my real commander, but he was the first guy to sit down and, hey, somebody's got to teach you this. So I, I yes. think one of the things I want to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on No, go, no, uh, go one, ahead, Nick. One, one of the things I offer uh, from a person who, who wants to be that mentee role is to have that um, humility aspect of, of constantly looking for people to give you feedback saying, hey, I know I did this okay, but I think I could do it better no matter what it is, whether it's presenting, commanding, writing, whatever those navigation things that you're trying to navigate of saying, like, hey, I, I know I can do this better and going out and seeking feedback. And that feedback could be one off. It could be feedback from somebody you respect or somebody you don't respect. I always say feedback is a gift. If somebody says, hey, I don't like what you did about X, Y, and Z. Even if I don't think it's applicable to me, it's really helpful to know what perception is. And perception can be reality in a lot of places. So, Yeah, you guys hit on a couple like really salient points, right? And the first is, is that it should be a board of advisors. So not just one person. And, you know... I have personally run into this, right, where, you know, I have a pretty wide, extensive chain of mentors at this point. I'm incredibly lucky to have that. It's very interesting the way they came about, right? Some are from personal problems. Some are from getting in trouble when I was younger, right? And getting called into an office and, hey, let's talk this out. And me realizing like, okay, this isn't personal. This is professional, right? And realizing I could have those professional conversations with those people, um, you know, Looking, so I took this article, I posted it on X, and, and got quite a bit of feedback, uh, you know, from people in the military on there, right? And so we talk about mentorship. Uh, someone writes, "It's been episodic. I've had a few people that I've been able to talk to on a limited basis, but I don't think I have ever found a real mentor. Uh, I don't believe in the army version of success. Rather, I believe in my own. So maybe that's the reason it has not worked out." Um, and so what would you say to somebody who has been in the military for, for years, right? They're not a junior soldier and they say they've never been mentored. Like what is the cause of that and how does that get rectified? I, uh, well, there's a, I, without knowing that individual person or situation, right. I, couldn't, I couldn't really tell, but I would offer that, um, you know, the army, the army from a professional standpoint is very clear in this definition of success. At least on the officer side is we're going to get you a Lieutenant Colonel. If you do all these gates, these key developmental spots, and get you to 05, that's that's career success. 
And like the individual said on, on X, hey, I, I don't agree with the Army's definition. I would say, what is your definition? And then who has already been there? Uh, who has navigated to that point? And then and go find, seek out those people. If you have a passion that's outside of the Army and that's what you really want to do, uh, then find those people to help you figure out how to get there as well. I'd also offer that like maybe you don't know what you want to do and it's okay to, to, to go out and do some research. And I think one of the most... Uh, Go ahead, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. I was just to glom onto that, like it, finding the people who've done what you've done, what you want to do is a great example, but have the humility to recognize that maybe what you think you want to do is not what you want to do. I, I wanted to do four years in the army as a signal officer and get out, and I didn't do any of that. Um, but the other thing is, once you found somebody who's done that, ask them. The one upside is, I don't think I've ever met a senior officer in the army that was too busy to talk about himself. So, yeah, I mean that's that is. That is true. And it's also incredibly helpful, right? Because generally when you ask people about their career progression, um, so, you know, we talk about good leaders, bad leaders getting advice. I had a good leader, right? Battalion commander who sat me down. I was a young lieutenant. So, you know, they were mentoring me as they should have by regulatory guidance, but really on, on a personal side and sat me down and said, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, for me, it's weird, right? Because at 20 years, I'm going to be a captain because I'm prior service. So the metric of success that the military has or the army has lieutenant colonel at 20 years, I don't fit into that box. And, you know, I said, well, sir, I don't really know. How do you define success? Like, what are you doing? And he literally went online and he popped up the general officer tab page, which will show you every general officer in the army, right? It's behind a CAC wall, but it will show you what assignments they have had, what they've done. And he said, this is someone that I am trying to emulate. And he said, look, right here, I can see all the assignments they have. And so my next plan is to do this, is to do that. Um, and putting himself on a fast track to be a general officer, right? By mimicking and copying and, you know, and reaching out to those people. And that was kind of an eye-opening moment for me when I realized, like, you can have a plan in the Army. You know, because I don't think when I talk to junior officers, a lot of them don't realize there's a lot of gates in the beginning. You're going to be a platoon leader. You're going to be an operations officer or an XO, depending on what your MOS calls it, right? And you are going to be a company or a detachment commander. But after that, it opens up, right? You know, you want to go do a congressional fellowship or work at the White House. Uh, you want to go to the Command General Staff College. You know, you want to go be a basic officer leader or captain's career course instructor, you know, the world is your oyster. You want to go teach at West Point? You can do that too. And oh, by the way, if you're doing well in your career, the army is going to pay for the degree for your master's degree that gets you there. Right. And so there's a lot of stuff that I think our junior officers, uh, one, aren't aware of. Right. And then two, when we talk about OERs and how to write them, they don't realize the implication. Like you had mentioned, Eric, right, with your, with your first OER, you know, Every evaluation matters, whether it's your first one or your last one. And I think some people get caught up in that. And so, you know, you talked about casting a wide net when it comes to having a mentor. You know, can you reach back and, and pinpoint like a moment in your career where you're like, man, this this was the person who helped me finally figure it out. Eric, what do you got? I, I still haven't finally figured it out. I, I still go up every, I, mean, I just hit another gate in my life and get ready to go to senior service college. And so it's like, Hey, what do I want to do when I grow up? Because I'm at another point in my career where I have to make those decisions. Um, to bring it back though, I will say this. There's a lot of people in the army who are going to tell you, you can't do X unless you do Y, or you can't do X because you want to do Y. And they're almost all wrong. Uh, I actually have done a stint at HRC. So this isn't just me, you know, talking, this is actually, I've seen the career tracks, but multiple points in my career, people told me, if you want to do this, you'll never do that. And this, this, this. And it's just been wrong on almost every single occasion. I've got friends who did Olmstead who were told that if you do the Olmstead scholarship, you'll never command a battalion. You'll never command the yada, yada, yada. And again, command might not be the thing that is actual career success. It's the one that the army tells us is success. And even if it doesn't tell us, it reinforces it. But I have successfully commanded a battalion despite doing multiple things that people told me you will never if you do this. Now, there are some there are some gates like there are some choices you're going to make a decision in life and it's going to it is going to change. But be cautious with the people who are just going to tell you you have to do the thing I did and follow in line behind me because I just I have not found that to actually be true. Nick, what are your thoughts? 
I, uh, well, one thing Eric always says is there's no such thing as kingmaker jobs, just kingmaker paperwork. You hear that thing a lot. Like, I just gotta get this one job and then I can get it. it and, you know, looking at the data doesn't support it. But going back to your original point, like, hey, when was the a time that somebody like sat down with you and all of a sudden stuff starts clicking in a place? And for me, it's not like one person. It's it's a lot of people. But one of the things that really sticks out to me, and I, I, I would try to get past the cliches, but it, it's my, been the NCOs in my career. And I'll give you an example of the first one. When I was a first lieutenant as an HHC XO, my first sergeant was a guy named Dave Stone. He's retired now down in down Georgia. Great. He would throw me in the Humvee and he would drive and we'd go around and check on on the different ranges that were going on. And while we were driving, uh, he had my undivided attention and the amount of wisdom and perspective that he passed off to me. Um, I'm still to these days, I'm still unpacking a lot of it as well. And it wasn't until, you know, a year or two or three years later that I'm reflecting back on it, realizing the genius of what he was doing. Because uh, if he had sat down, in his, if he called me into his office or we had scheduled something, it had been real awkward and it would have been really hard for me to like be receptive to it. But when you got time to kill 45 minutes to go out to the range, uh, you got to pass the time somehow. And I was all ears. I would yeah, definitely I mean, dump me, on that one. You know, we have a tendency I, I, to talk like uh, your, your officers or your mentors. <laughs> NCOs are yeah. some of the best and they're the ones who will actually give you their time. Like they're the ones who will sit there in the car and drive with you for 45 minutes and, and they have no problem being the one to tell you and educate you. So like never underestimate Nick and I've actually shared some NCO mentors. Josh Johnson comes to mind. He was his first sergeant uh, when I was an XO and Nick was a company commander and like that guy helped us a ton. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I mean, I think, you know, we talk about casting a wide net of mentors. You know, I have quite a few uh, sergeants major on there, you know, at all levels, denominative level. Um, You know, I've got quite a few first sergeants, right? And, you know, I got to be honest, right? When I was an NCO, I was not a great NCO, right? I was good at my job. I was a technical EOD expert. I could do the work, but when it came to leadership and being an NCO, you know, I probably wasn't the best. And and I fell into that fallacy where uh, I thought I was better than I was, you know. And, you know, one of my best friends, he's currently a first sergeant and he's a first sergeant who is who is fast tracked throughout his entire career. Right. We've been friends since we were privates together at EOD school. And I constantly reach back to him to to say, hey, man, like I didn't realize it at the time. Right. But you got this figured out. You know, when we talk about the new evaluation boards that have come out, um, you know, he's one of those people that knows how to write evaluations. And so when we see these EOD techs come out on the most qualified list, you know, for for promotion, what I've noticed is, right, the last couple of years, like those are people that are coming out of his organization because he knows how to mentor, develop and to write as well. And I think that's the key one, right? There's there can be a difference between a good mentor and a good writer. We talk about evaluations. You guys have a comment in your paper that you wrote. The things that don't get written down in an FM but are critical to your success as a soldier, that is what mentorship is. And so are people at a giant disadvantage when they don't have a mentor in the military? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, it's not... Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, we have people that are constantly thinking about us and looking out for us and, and trying to push energy into us. But going back to my original comment, you've got to be willing to receive it and you've got to go find it and, and harvest it as well. I think one of the things we, we talk about and that an article is about, all, and you mentioned it, is all the things that are unwritten that matter. And one of the things they say a lot of times in Special Forces, which is true across every, everywhere in the world, but we just happen to say it as a ma- mantra, is that you're always being assessed. And I think some people go through life thinking that there's only certain times I'm being assessed and the rest of the time I'm not really in the spotlight. But in reality, people are always paying attention. And so they may wonder why am I hitting a barrier or a glass ceiling in my career? And it's probably because of some behavior or performance or interaction they had that they didn't think they were being assessed, but in, in fact they were, right? Like your reputation matters. And that's probably the, the number one thing that, that passed so, off. Nick really kind of hit it on, but like one of the great things about mentors isn't just the formal career guidance. It's it's that external look that's going to tell you where you're bumping up against stuff. So they're going to help you find your blind spots. They're going to help you find your rough spots. When when you're trying to solve problems, you head down into them. And then next thing you know, you're bumping up against peers and you're rubbing them the wrong way because you're just trying to solve a problem and don't realize, like, hey, you're not winning right now. Like, you need to be changing, change your approach, change your aperture, bring people on board. Mentors can be really great for helping you navigate that external look to yourself. 
What would you guys say to somebody, you know, who says, well, because, you know, I'm in, I'm an explosive ordnance disposal technician. It's a small career field. You guys are both special forces. You know, what would you say to somebody that says, well, you guys are getting mentorship because of the small nature of your career field. People are looking out for you, but me, I'm in a line unit and I'm not afforded the, you know, the same benefit. How would you push back on that? I think the big one for me, I jump right in. Oh, <laughs> all right, Nick. I was going to say, first off, we know plenty of special forces guys who have not gotten mentorship. Like this is not a unique, everything's always greener over on, on the soft side. No, there's plenty of SF guys who don't get it either. Um, but the other time, if you're not, it's okay. Like, I mean, again, every, every unit has leaders, um, NCOs and every single unit in the army. I haven't met one yet. that not have NCOs. There's people there that can provide that mentorship. I just, I would definitely widen your aperture. It's not, it's almost always not your commander. Like it's not running up a chain. It's usually your mentorship is going to be coming from a lateral direction. It's coming from somebody who's willing to take the time to kind of help coach you along and show you little things that you don't think matter. Learn how to write an email is one of the most like important arts that you will learn as an army officer, even though it's not something that you would think of as impactful. But like that can be hugely, hugely important to how you're perceived and how, how successful you are on being able to get what you want done. Yeah, I, like I said, I did my first officer tour was uh, third ID. We were on the Martin Express doing the, the Iraq pumps. And I, I got, I had lots of interactions uh, that you could characterize as mentorship. Every time somebody sat down with me uh, at the dining facility and, and had a conversation or when an officer pulled me, a senior officer pulled me and goes, hey, this is what I'm working on right now. I want to show you what I'm doing so that when it's your turn, you've, you've seen one way to do it as well. I, I guess I probably have a much broader aperture on what I consider mentorship. And every time somebody went out of their way to show me something or teach me something or um, to, to kind of probe my thoughts on something, I wrap all that up. And the, all those little pebbles together, uh, I, I consider holistically as, as a mentorship aspect. And I think our culture in the profession of arms lends to that because I think we're always thinking about how do I get ready, the people coming behind me in case I'm incapacitated or when I move on and I want them to succeed as, as my uh, my successor, right? And whether, whatever that is. And then also in a selfish aspect, uh, you know, company commander today, battalion commander tomorrow, if you want untrained people working behind you, then don't invest in them now. And so you can't push all this off to professional military education. It has to also occur within, within our uh, profession of arms. So interactions as well. Yeah. I think you hit on something My, uh, really important there. I, oh, go ahead, Eric. I was just going to say, like I had a commander in Iraq that like, that wasn't like a subtle thing. That was an overt thing. Uh, company commander lost his leg. And so new commander comes in. And he completely changed the way that we were doing everything in the company. First thing he did was basically just give all the lieutenants a whole bunch of calendar and go, hey, what are you going to do with it? And we we're like, we, no, you tell me what patrols you want me to do. And he's like, nope, you're going to figure it out. Because if I go down like the last guy did, you're running things. And then that was that was eye opening for me as a first lieutenant, even 12 months, you know, a 12 month tour, I'm like six months in, I think I know what I'm doing. And suddenly I don't know anything. And so that drove home to me the idea of, hey, every time you're working with your subordinates, like you're replacing yourself. Yeah, Nick, you hit on something I think really important there when you talked about, you know, breaking bread together because I'm a, I'm a very very firm believer, right, that uh, breaking bread with somebody is the best way to accomplish, you know, a conversation. Just and it has to do with, you know, like people's basal states are kind of uh, reduced when they're eating, uh, you know, their protective forces are down. And it's like that's the best time to have a conversation and I and I will tell you some of the best mentorship I have ever received was in a dining facility. Right. Because I knew that the battalion commander or the brigade commander or, you know, the sergeant major, you know, would be there having lunch. And so, you know, when you're sitting there in the dining facility and that battalion commander walks in and they start looking around for a place to sit, you know, where do they naturally gravitate towards? Right. Like, you know, the, the mindset is literally like, oh, look, there's a young lieutenant. Let me go mentor him. Right. Which is like not a not a bad thing. I'm not bashing it at all. But, you know, I would argue that some of the best conversations I have had have been, you know, over a meal. And then some have straight up been targets of opportunity. You know, I was at a conference and it just so happened that Command Sergeant Major Hendricks was there, the, you know, former TRADOC Sergeant Major. And, you know, I happened to be the only captain there. And like so that, that interested him. Right. Like, why is this captain here? And he sat me down and he talked to me for an hour. I mean, legitimately, like, I wish I could have recorded the wisdom that came out of that man's mouth because it was incredibly helpful. It was incredibly practical. Right. And it was just 
solid advice. And he did that because he wanted to, not because he was obligated to, but because he just saw me and he was like, you, I'm going to talk to you. Right. And it was great. It was intimidating, but it was great. That, that's um, a good point at, at uh, first group. If you guys ever, if anybody ever gets a chance to go to JBLM, the first group dining facility, I would offer you get more work done at the first group DFAC than you do in any PowerPoint led uh, meetings as well. Uh, and I always remember even as a captain, you know, the people would tell me like, Hey, you got to make sure you do your rotations through the dining facility, go, go eat your lunch at DFAC, go eat your breakfast. Uh, Cause you get to have those interactions. I don't, I don't need to schedule an office call and have a bunch of read aheads. If I can just sit down and, and knock it out in like two minutes, or if I go break bread with somebody, uh, the other thing that happens is when you're a battalion, whatever, a battalion three, how hard is it to talk to other all the other battalion threes? But if you're all there having breakfast together after PT, or you're there at lunch grabbing a quick bite to eat, you can get a lot of work done. A lot of coordination can happen in, in between bites there as well. So uh, not only is breaking bread good for building emotional bonds, but your your unit defac if it's the culture is right, you can get a lot done there. Yeah, I mean that's that walk around leadership piece. Sorry. Uh, just the biggest thing I, that to bring it back to the article, though. So yes, one hundred percent in person mentorship, invaluable. Informal mentorship, invaluable. But what do you do when you can't? What do you do when you can't be in person all the time? Uh, when yeah. the O club goes away, and when everybody talks, well, bring back the O club. No, none of us, none of us have the time to go to the O club anymore. Like the world's moved on, and so that I think is where we tried to get with the article was driving home the idea of hey, like. You've got to be able to engage with people outside of that one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, like we supplement it. We actually do live meetups with NSTR now um, about once a month. We get people together or people do a shout. Hey, I'm going to be in D.C. Who's available? And like people informally get together. But the, the conversation has to move to a disaggregated forum. And that's where online mentorship, I think, is, is really the next, the forward for, uh, progression of this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and when we talk about, you know, it's the water cooler of the next generation, like that's what social media is. All my junior soldiers are on social media, you know, whether they are on Instagram, TikTok, X, uh, I don't think they're old enough for Facebook, right? <laughs> because that's like, you know, myself and my parents, you know, social media platform of choice. But when we talk about that, I guess here's a question that I've noticed quite a bit in the social media space is there seems to be a lot of hesitancy uh, from leaders to be on that space, right? To, to engage with people. And so I guess the question becomes, right, how do we get more people interested uh, in doing that, right? Because I agree with you both in your article that online mentorship is, is going to be imperative. It's going to be key to success of future leaders. But how do we get the people with the experience into the space? Yeah. Uh, let me jump on that one first. So uh, a lot of people are... Um a lot of leaders are very nervous about engaging on social media. One, they're worried about some imaginary rule that says they can't do it or they're gonna speak on behalf of the government or something that's gonna get them in hot water. And then to justify their concerns, occasionally a senior leader will say something that becomes a soundbite and then they get pilloried uh, right on social media or the press. And so if we wanna to get to the point where we're having much more professional, mature, frequent conversations online, we have to one, underwrite mistakes, Two, treat it from a good faith approach that people are trying to come at it from a good faith, both the um, the subordinates and the senior ranking people. And the three realize that like, this is how we communicate with the formation. You hear all the times in leaders school that like, if you think you're ever communicating, you're probably not because go ask, you know, go ask a junior soldier what your priorities are and they'll, they'll, they'll probably not say them back to you. And so uh, if you want to reach your audience, then you have to go where your audience is. And that means more than just a command and staff or, a, or an O&I meeting. That means you got to get out and you got to talk to them, not only at the motor pool or the dining facility, but also where they're, they're, they're taking their news and their information from. I mean, that's the thing. The online life is not a different, it, it's, it's the same part of everybody's experience by and large, particularly for the younger generations. And I'm weird calling it, I'm a geriatric millennial and I'm saying younger generations, including myself, but well, the Sergeant Major Commander will tell you, hey, you got to walk through the barracks. And I'm like, that's true. But you got to walk through the online barracks, too, just to see what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we are all in agreement there. And so, you know, one of the comments that was made when I took this article and posted it on X, uh, quite a few comments were people that were concerned about fraternization. You know, the Army fraternization rule in 600-20 uh, really was rewritten in, I think, March of 2014, right? 
And so you have people that are concerned that if they engage online and social media, this will somehow be misconstrued as, you know, favoritism or they're fraternizing because perhaps the person that they're mentoring uh, is an enlisted or an officer uh, and they are the opposite of that. And so how do we push back on that kind of narrative? You know, I, I, I got one for that one. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear in UCMJ it, that the purpose for fraternization is to prevent uh, the undermining of good order and discipline, right? And so if somebody's going to say to me, like, hey, I don't want to engage the troops and I don't want to help people navigate their careers and I don't want to communicate in a professional and open manner because I think it's going to undermine good order and discipline, then we've got a bigger problem with our leadership structure. I think we just have to walk people through saying, hey, just like using a weapon or driving a vehicle, there's proper behavior. And, and if you do it right, it can actually make us a whole lot better for it. But I, I understand why a lot of people are scared. They see somebody, they'll do... They'll, they'll chase the dopamine hits, trying to get likes and retweets and everything else. And they'll say something that's maybe unprofessional or, or it's crossing the line because they, they got so caught up in the game of being in, of engagement. But I think you just got to uh, you know, train people on it. And then you got to also underwrite those mistakes, like I said earlier. So with that, we kind of looked and we talked a little bit in the article about it. You have different social media platforms. They're different. And you got to use them in the right way. So X or Facebook are these just like town halls. Anybody can say anything they want to everybody in the world and everybody can see it. And there's value in that. There's ability to reach out and there's ability to put out messages. But it's not something that we found particularly helpful for mentorship because you can't have really productive conversations. Now, I saw an officer about two years ago jump on X, then Twitter and complain about not being able to do leg tucks. That was a DM message right back to the officer. Hey, here's some tips and pointers. Um, and so that's your other alternative is on the other end of the spectrum, you have the direct messaging, you have signal and all these other, we're just doing a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And those are good too, but it limits the conversation that can be had. It limits the perspectives. And so the, the third kind of midway is these federated sites. And that's where we ended up with, with NSTR on, on discord and teams previously, where you can kind of contain who's in and who's got access. But once you're in there, you can foster a good conversation. Um, and Nick and I have been using, I used it as a battalion commander. I used MS teams as you know, the army gave it to us. There was, there was definitely a whole separate social media channel where we were sharing articles and we were having conversation and stuff like that. And so no notes on Nick's description, like, Hey, this is good order of discipline. Yeah, yeah I, no, I, I agree. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. I was gonna say that the teams, let's, let's dive into the teams thing. Like teams is a huge, again, I don't want to like say this is the, the best product in the world. There's a lot of products out there that are useful slack teams, discord, whatever. Uh, but the fact that the army has given us this ability to basically create our own town hall, uh, and be able to share information. I understand that we, we probably will take a lot of bad habits like SharePoint and email and orders process and try to use teams that way, which is fine. But if you're trying to create a, a much more flat organization where not only can leaders communicate down, but you can also foster conversation and coordination below, uh, things like teams are great ways of doing it. And what it's going to take is people to, to, open up their perspective on what these tools can do and then uh, allow for some of this stuff to happen naturally and organically. And some of the things we talked about in the article were just because you build it doesn't mean people are going to participate. They're going to be scared to, to post something because their boss is watching or they're going to feel obligated to read everything their boss posts as well. So you have to find people that can operate uh, that can help seed the site with you know information that you want to foster as a conversation. So for example, if somebody says, Hey, article and they type an interesting period, uh, that's probably the laziest post you could do. You see it on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, what they should say is, hey, here's an article. It's related to us. Here's what I think is interesting. Here's the summary. I'm really curious about X. Who, what do you guys think? And you can generate a conversation. And those interactions, even hearing uh, competent or, or um, ignorant uh, responses to it can really, uh, really open up your perspective on, on what your formation is thinking about. Yeah, the, yeah, the, so interesting, let's, let's the interesting about, post is oh, the ahead, laziest. It's the see below of the email, right? It's the worst. If you're the person doing that, if you're doing the see the below email or you're doing the interesting with article shared, lowest energy possible, come on, like, engage with it. And so Nick and I talk about like, we'll have a tendency to do that. When somebody posts something like that, we will immediately follow up with, hey, what was it about it that caught your eye? Or what did you disagree with? Or something like that to, to start the conversation. But there's a lot of value in, in the people that are not having the conversation. I go back to college, you know, went to Michigan State, 300 people in a lecture hall, not a lot of people raising their hands, but they're all getting out of it. And so don't feel that, oh, because everybody's not chiming in the conversation, you're not getting value out of those forums. 
So let's talk some more about, you know, the Harding Project, right? So we're, we're trying to re-energize and get back to professional writing. But I think, you know, a question, right, when we have this next generation of warfighters that's all on social media, you know, how do we get them to read those articles, you know, because there is a, you know, whether it is right or wrong, there is a perception that a lot of professional military writing is kind of an echo chamber, right? It, it's written and read by the same people, you know, and then at the same time, that professional writing is then taken and, and you know, it's on an evaluation report, it's on, you know, on, on someone's resume, hey, look, I did this professional writing, but who read it? Right. And so how do we get, you know, I understand the reprofessionalization of professional writing, right? How do we get people to read that writing? Yeah, I'll, let me jump in first. So part of the problem was, uh, or at least the Harding Projects, uh, one of the problem statements was, is that we've let uh, professional writing atrophy. T two reasons. One is uh, we've pushed all the professional doctrinal writing to a certain subclass of officers. And they're the ones that are all talking to each other. And the second one is high gloss military journals that probably reside in your latrine aren't being read and communicated. That's not how people are, are uh, ingesting ideas. So a way to go about it is to uh, democratize or, or renew the way that people are communicating. So one is writing articles, uh, but also engaging online or hosting a, a, a podcast to talk about the professional writing that's going online or to create social media posts and saying, hey, what do you guys think about this article as well? If we don't do that, then we're seeding the, our military thought, our professional thought to a group of people that um, may not necessarily have as much skin in the game before. So we need, we need the sergeants and we need the lieutenants, despite them not only having a year or two of experience to write what their thoughts are, because they're the ones that are going to have to execute it. And then going back to your comment about, hey, this is going to go on an eval, I would offer uh, that it probably is not... If people are writing because they think it's going to help their eval out, they probably got other problems going on in their career, and that's probably not the right metrics to chase. You should write agree. because it's the right thing to do for our profession, the profession of arms, and that driving these conversations forward and in public uh, is going to make us better for it as well. And so a metric to say, hey, how do I know the thing's successful or not, is if it's the emails you get back from senior leaders or retirees going, I like the article, or hey, here's why I think you're wrong, and here's what you're missing. Or it's the working group to do a policy to, to talk about your problem, or it's uh, an investigation that wasn't moving anywhere and somebody did a news article about it and now all of a sudden there's a bunch of traction happening for it as well. So professional writing and engaging in all these types of things is, is about uh, making the profession stronger and more resilient. So with that, the couple of things I want to jump on to, this is, this is where NSDR has been like just incredibly beneficial for me, is first off, there's too much stuff to read. NSTR is a curator for me. I go in there. If I see an article and it's getting posts and it's getting responses, I'm like, okay, I need to read that one. And that has direct, I, multiple times I walked into a room and general officer brought up an article and I was the only one who read it. And I read it because somebody shared it last week on NSTR and started a conversation about it because it was controversial or whatever. So that's like the first, like the last four audiobooks I've gotten on Audible were all ones that started in the conversation on NSTR. So it's, it's great to have these other people to help you know, what should I read? But it's also a great place to shop it ahead of time. So we have a writing channel in there and people will post everything from grad school papers they're working on to articles they're working on. It's like a great place. Uh, when I came out of command, one of the guys challenged me to write, like, what were your lessons learned? Like the day I gave the guide on, I'm like, give me a break. I'm glad he did because I wouldn't have written that article the next like week. But the next day I sat down, I typed in a bunch of notes. It's still very rough, but it's stuff and guys are giving your feedback to it and they're helping develop that. And so it's this online forum can be really great because it's, it's an engagement process versus the journals, which are great but they are a fault. They're a polished finished product. And so how do you get to that product? Yeah. I mean, you know, I posted, you know, I know I've said it a couple of times, right. But posting your guys' article on X, I really thought, you know, there's some posts that really hit and there's some that they really don't. Right. I thought, you know, quite frankly, if I posted a military journal on social media, it was going to be one of those posts that did not hit, you know, quite frankly. Right. Uh, instead, it got, you know, over 20,000 views. It got multiple, you know, reposts or retweets or whatever the kids are calling it these days. Right. And tons of comments, you know, with people giving their input, like, Hey, I've never had a mentor. How do I get a mentor? Can I go buy one? You know, like, like comments like that. Right. But you know, these comments from people that, you know, I, I would argue that mentorship is, is a topic that is very like, you know, 
important to people in the military, right? Because I think everyone knows deep down I'm supposed to have a mentor, right? And there's almost a, a, a shame associated with it when you're like four, five, six years in the military and you don't have one, right? Now, like the pushback I would give is that you're getting mentored. You may not realize you're getting mentored. It might be micro mentorship, right? It might be, you know, that one time you get called to task in the office and, and get talked to by your boss or your boss's boss. Um, but you're getting some form of mentorship. Now, maybe you don't have a person you can call, you know, at night and be like, hey, I just ran into this issue at work. How do I handle it? Uh, but people are getting mentored. And so, you know, looking ahead, what do you kind of see as the future for online mentorship? Let's start with you, Nick. Yeah. So I, just going back to that last comment you had, I, do people want a mentor or do they want a patron? They want somebody who's like telling them, looking out for their career and like opening doors for them. Is that what they're asking for? Because that's not necessarily what a mentor does. Uh, and if that's what you want, that's probably not really how the military is set up. In some cases there are, there's the, there's a, there's a good old boy and girls network where that'll, that'll happen, but that has not been my experience at, at all. And nor would I want it to be. I'd want, I'd much rather have a choose your own adventure career, but the, the future of, the future of mentorship is still going to happen. It's going to be these water cooler interactions. It's going to be formal. It's going to be when my boss or my senior raider uh, brings me in to have conversations. It's going to be times at the dining facility where I sit down with not my battalion commander, but maybe somebody else's battalion commander uh, who's got a perspective to share. Maybe they're not in my career field. A logistics battalion commander or a, an MI battalion commander would love to hear about their careers as well. And then for the online one, I think this is only going to continue to grow. And I think we're going to have to figure out what is acceptable and what isn't as far as online interaction. And I know that the current, the pervasive feeling that only the most senior leaders can get online and the most junior people can get online, but everybody in the middle, all of us middle bureaucrats, if we get online, we put unnecessary risk on our careers. I think we've got to get past that and we've got to be much more willing to have those engagements. So that's what I think we're going to do. I think it's going to keep growing and I think we're just going to have to mature and, and underwrite the mistakes that happen. Eric. I think the leaders are going to have to embrace this one and they're going to have to adapt a little bit. So I was talking to Nick yesterday. I'm here at the pre-command course right now. Like I said, first generation of millennials are hitting the brigade pre-command courses now. And so there's a divide. And the interesting thing is there's a lot of conversation in my group about, and about all the groups really about, about getting memed. And people are really worried about getting memed because of online social media. And I'm like, and Nick, Nick, he hit it perfectly. That we already did this. This is the skits. We used to do skits all the time. We made fun of each other. It's a, the warrior poet society has always been there since, you know, ancient Vikings and before. I'm sure there was stuff in ancient Rome where people were having, like, we enjoy good wit. And sometimes it's not good wit. And you got to work and you got to police it. But there is a, there's an aversion among, you know, senior leaders in the Army today about getting memed instead of realizing, like, hey, this is part of the thing. Now, again, there's lines of professionalism, quarter and discipline. We already talked about all that. But, like, embrace it. Like, I love a good meme. I love a good gif. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think – you know, there's, there's utility to getting memed, right? Because it lets you know what the formation actually cares about, you know? So if you go and do X and the result is you're getting memed about it because they see you as being, you know, perhaps disingenuous or you're focused on the wrong thing, you know, there's a utility to seeing that you've gotten memed, right? And being like, okay, here is what the formation actually cares about. I'm over here doing this, but actually, you know, this is what they care about, right? So maybe, you know, it's time to redirect focus. Uh, you know, one of my go-tos is always like, the soldiers are always talking, right? Uh, if they're not talking to you, they're probably talking about you, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, if they don't feel comfortable having that conversation with you, the result is memes and gifts, And that allows us, you know, as leaders, the ability to uh, either look inwards or maybe they just don't have the full visibility on, on why, leaders are doing what they're doing, which just means, hey, it's probably time for some more open communication with the formation as to why this is a priority. Um, hey, Eric, Nick, I leave you guys with, you know, if there's any parting shots that you want to take um, before we before we wrap this up. Nick, let's start with you. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I've been very fortunate that people have given me feedback throughout my career, and I've also been seeking it out. I would offer that if you're in a place where you're struggling to figure out who's mentoring you, um, some some ways to go about it is to ask for office calls or go out to have a coffee with somebody that you that you think you might want to uh, know more about that could provide information for. 99% uh, uh, of the time in my career when I've asked for 
15, 20 minutes of somebody's time, not only have they made time for me, they've also expanded upon it. Uh, the, one, the one exception that somebody was not forthright or, or pretty open with me, I think they were just busy. But on the whole, our profession is pretty good about, uh, if it's from a genuine uh, standpoint, they've been pretty good about it as well. The other thing is when um, somebody says you've got a, a hole in your swing, you got a problem, uh, you, there's some obligation for you to go back and do some self-study and self-reflection. Well, quick example, I, uh, I had a presentation early on as a captain. I was super nervous. I didn't do very well in the presentation and uh, the CSM let me know. And so I spent some time going to figure out how do I do a better, do better presentations? How do I prepare better? Uh, TED Talks, uh, books, how do I do that as well? And so one of the things I do now is um, I use that mortifying experience where somebody pulled me off the side and said, hey, you didn't do so great. Uh, and I use that as a motivation to, to improve upon it. So that growth mindset is huge as well. So I would just say the last thing for me was there were a lot of comments that we saw back to the article um, in particular uh, towards like, hey, how do you find time to mentor people? And I, I just got to be really honest. One, do it. Like one, it's your job. The army tells you to do it. But two, like it's absolutely most impactful thing you'll do. Like 90% of what you will do in the army will probably not last too much longer except for the mentorship that you give. That will last beyond you. And it might last another generation. I talked about stolen lines from the best commanders I worked for. The first time I heard somebody use one of my lines, oh my God, just makes your day when you hear a subordinate repeating something you you created. It pays off. But it's also in particular, and I, I kind of want to talk about the technology is changing and it's moving rapidly. Um, and so if anything, as a mentor now, like stay close because you're going to get mentored up from subordinates who are using tools and techniques that, that you don't know about. I mean, Nick is the reason I know about Stable Diffusion and ChatGPT is because he's working AI right now and he's keeping me abreast of that technology. Um, and so I sit in rooms all the time now where people are like, who's ChatGPT? And I'm just like, it's the, the bottom up is coming. So it's worth it. It's absolutely worth your time and energy to, to invest that in, in another soldier. Hey, Eric, Nick, uh, thank you guys so much for taking the time to sit down. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about the Harding Project and kind of the future of mentorship through social media. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, look, I look forward to being on the Discord and picking your brain some more and getting some mentorship from both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great day. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Mike, thank you a ton, man. Really appreciate you giving us the time. Absolutely.